I read the book and I found it very uh, inspiring that short term, you make some short term goals. The long term goal is to become Krishna conscious fully. But there's short term goals that can lead to the, the long term goal. And some of the things that we are illustrating and discussing and presenting are more like short term goals that help us come to a higher stage of Krishna consciousness. So for instance, one of the things I took away from that book is, um, I want to perfect my chanting. So I think, all right, what do I have to do? And what, what attitude should I you know, develop in order to achieve, you know, a perfection in chanting, or at least come to that stage of being on the path of perfection. So that's a short-term goal, but it ultimately leads to, you know, the, the bigger goal, Prema Pumartha Mahan, love of God. <clears throat> but the one thing that's unique about spiritual goals as opposed to material goals, material goals are ephemeral, and they're not necessarily destined for a person to achieve them. Spiritual goals are actually the nature of the living entity's intrinsic quality. We love Krishna, it's there. It can't be taken away, it can never be lost. It can only be forgotten, covered over. So to uncover that, yeah, it's the perfection of life, which is the law, which is the perf which is the long-term goal, or the success of all other goals. So, what would we do here? Take something away from here that you want to maybe you see that can help you in your Krishna consciousness, and put some concentration, some effort, some what we say uh, gathering of knowledge based on the activity. Srila Prabhupada, he, he said something about himself. He said, I had to walk through fire to, to spread this movement. He said, I didn't look left, I didn't look right. I just looked at the goal straight ahead. And he had to go through hell. I mean, you study the life of Prabhupada. And it wasn't easy. <laughs> and even in the it was, it was not only difficult, some people say what he achieved was impossible. But he had that determination. He had the understanding that this is what his spiritual master asked him to do. So fixed on the instructions of the spiritual master. And with that determination, he spread the movement. We can do that in a smaller way in our own practice of Krishna consciousness. So choose something. If you could take one powerful point away in which you can implement into your day-to-day -day life, then this whole retreat is a success for you. Just one thing. But if you can take more, that's, that's even more laudable or greater. So when people say, oh, let's see. Hmm? What do you mean to see that last point? If you can take away one? That is laudable. Oh. Well, uh, applaudable. <laughs> that is something, that's, that's the success of coming here. <laughs> we might say that. There's so much that we talk about that all centers around the same goal. But ultimately, it's seen from different angles. And there's different aspects to it. And that's what these verses are. Like, just like one of them is getting rid of the offenses. So a devotee might think, now I'm going to try to do whatever I can to avoid committing offenses. So that's, that's, that's a sankalpa. And then whatever is, whatever is required, they bring into that consciousness. And then they focus on that. 
or I want to become humble. And then you think, what do I need to practice humility to its perfection? Or I want to become tolerant. Or I want to, as Prabhupada's example was, I want to get up early and channel my rounds early. So these are these are different sankalpas or goals that lead to the bigger goal, the long, the long range goal. So if we pick one of them and just focus on that, and then that results will situate our consciousness on a higher level where we can take on the next step and then move forward like that. And just like chanting the holy name, one of the things that helps us to chant is to know the glories of the holy name. So therefore, we a lot of our talks, books, discussions about the glories of the holy name. It's exclusive position above everything else. So then we focus on that, and then we get more of an inspiration for chanting. And we realize what I'm doing when I'm chanting is the highest form of spiritual practice. So that inspires you to continue in that way. So some, in the material world they call it positive thinking. We don't have to think positive because whatever is in the scriptures is a inspiration to follow that. And therefore, if we do it, it's guaranteed to work. Positive thinking will follow that automatically. Like, for instance, this book by Mahatma. Uh, he's written this little thing called uh, Japa Affirmations. What is an affir affirmation? It means a promise to do something before the activity. Is that correct? Yes. So, all right, you make an affirmation, I'm going to do this. And then you do everything you can to achieve it. That's all. But then, in order to be fixed in that, we have to somehow or other move away from our material desires. Because material desires will pollute our determination. And Krishna tells that to Arjuna. When Arjuna says, you know, to control the mind, <laughs> is impossible, it's difficult, it's like controlling the wind. And Krishna agrees with him. But he says, by constant practice and detachment, so that detachment that he's talking about is detaching ourselves from things that will take away from the, pro the process of mind control. What he means is that material activities, material desires, Oh yeah. I mean, I've seen people in, in the material world when they want something, they go for it. <laughs> this, this, that sometimes they're more determined than devotees in achieving their goals, but their goals don't really give them the uh, satisfaction and happiness because it's material. Material means ephemeral. Material means temporary. And material means not necessarily the desired outcome. You get the goal, you achieve it, but you may, you, you can't see what that will bring. It may bring the opposite instead of bringing the satisfaction that you're looking for. But in Krishna consciousness, we focus on these, these goals that are recommended, then there's no, there's nothing else. The goal, when the, when the goal is achieved, it will give you that satisfaction. It will give you that happiness. It will give you that freedom from material suffering. Mm -hmm. So wait, there's an advantage when you make a determination in Krishna consciousness. And you also have the support of Krishna. When Krishna sees, oh, this person really wants me, he helps. When you get the help of Krishna, then 
then that's a, that's, that's a big thing, <laughs> to use a simple explanation. So Prabhupada talks about the fact that we may make a mistake, but we should just try not to make the same mistake. And we should learn from every situation. We can learn from things that happen to us. We can learn from, from things which have happened to others. We can learn from instances which are given in the scriptures. There's so many opportunities to learn. I, I do want to emphasize a point that Mark made, which I think is absolutely fundamental to everything. It's all about our desire. You know, so my spiritual master gave the example, he said, if you have a nine to five job and your boss is very strict and you can only go to lunch between 12 p.m. and 1 p.m., but you find out that the bank near your workplace at 3 p.m. is giving $1,000 or $10,000 to whoever comes to the bank, even though your boss is very strict, you will find some way to be at that bank. <laughs> On time to claim your money, you know, because the desire is not just desire; it's how strong the desire is in in relation to the to the challenge. So the issue isn't the challenge; the issue is the strength of our desire in relation to the challenge. This is an ISKCON feature. There's a brahmachari. There's a mataji. Okay. The Ramachari wants to stay Brahmachari, the Mataji wants to marry that Brahmachari. <laughs> I mean, I've seen it. I can tell stories about this. And so the question is he wants to stay Brahmachari, she wants to marry him. So who wins? <laughs> If she wants him more than he wants Krishna, she wins. If he wants Krishna more than she wants him, he wins. So as he was talking about the strength of desire, so desire is there, but it can be what we say, what we call, what is that? Drita Vrata? Absolute. So, you know, and I won't tell any personal stories about that. Yeah. I see that happen. I see one brahmachari go down. <laughs> Should I tell the story? <laughs> Nuvardhavan. Okay. The leader of the brahmacharis. And Mataji, she wanted to marry him. And she used to go in front of the deities and pray. I would watch her. She'd go into the deity. I knew she was, she was praying. <laughs> <laughs> it was really sincere. He found out, and then he was praying <laughs> not to get trapped. <laughs> but her desire was so strong. I mean, really. I mean, she wasn't going to give up. So, he decided to see what Krishna wants. Okay. So we built this lake across the street from the temple. It was a man-made lake. It was pretty big. And it had a raft in the middle of the lake. So he decided to make an experiment to see what Krishna actually wants. Should I get married or should I stay Brahmacharya? So he decided to make an experiment. And he, 
He said, I'm going to sleep on this raft in the middle of the lake. The raft will be in the middle. And if I wake up on the east side, I'll stay brahmachari. And if I wake up on the west side, I'll get married. This is a true story. I'm, you can ask, you can ask some of the residents. And so he sat, he went to sleep that night, and he woke up at 1.30 or 2 o'clock, and he was on the east side. But then he went back to sleep. Because <laughs> he was thinking, this is too early to get up. <laughs> There's another message here, too. <laughs> And then you, you know, you can figure out the, the ending. It was on the west side when he woke up. So the idea is don't sleep, don't go oversleep. <laughs> You'll get caught. There's <laughs> not too many brahmacharis here, but anyway. <laughs> so, but that's a true story. And he got married. Actually, the marriage was quite nice. He was a good husband and she was excellent wife from what I, I could have observed. You know. So, yeah. So, the point was, back to what Buddha Bhavana said, it's desire, but strength of desire. When two desires are opposite each other, the one that's stronger will suit. So you have to feed your spiritual desire and not feed your material desire. The, the two dogs, the good dog and the bad dog, yeah. feed the good dog and that dog will win. Don't f feed the other dog and that dog will win. It's what you feed, what you focus on. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so the question is relating to this um, mood that the devotee doesn't see friends and enemies in that sense, doesn't see that dualistic thing. I don't. My understanding, Maharaj, feel free to correct me, is that it doesn't mean that we don't have friendships in in the association of devotees, mm -hmm. but it means we don't have the, a, a, the partiality that you know this person gratifies my senses, so they're my friend. This person doesn't gratify my senses, so they're my enemy. Is in the mundane sense, you know, but, of, but of course, in the, trend, in the in the association of devotees, one should cultivate friendship with devotees, because by our friendship with devotees, as Marge was mentioning, we can actually understand how we can improve. We can understand how we're doing. We can get advice. We can encourage each other. You know, we can have those loving exchanges. We can serve the devotees, and all of this is favorable for our spiritual advancement. Does that? Is there a friendship in spiritual world? Yes. Yes. That's one of the rasas, right? Yeah. Yeah, Sakya Ras. Oh, you can be Krishna and Shiva, but Shiva and Shiva. No, no. We're friends with each other. What's in the highest is reflected in the lowest. But there it's. There's no inebriates, there's no deterioration here. What's in the spiritual world is actually, what's here is a, what we call a perverted reflection. It's a reflection, but it doesn't have, the, it looks the same, but it doesn't have the same substance. Because everything here is under the influence of the three modes. And therefore, the, the uh, the living entity is not perfect in the material world, so you can't have perfection. But there, friendship is there, and friendship is ideal, perfect. So they love Krishna as a friend, and they have friends between each other also. Same thing we do here. But here, it's, there's problems. 
in order to establish something ideal, and then you can't really establish something ideal. Even if you do, time changes the whole situation. But not, the time is not, it doesn't affect the spiritual realm. It's not, time is conspicuous by its absence. Prabhupada said that when you when you go back to the spiritual world, you'll be you'll you'll recognize me. I'll be there to greet you. <laughs> so the relationships we develop here can also become eternal. They become eternal. It's not that they are eternal; they can become eternal. Just like the deity, the deity is not the deity is Krishna, but the deity is not eternally Krishna. Because at one point it wasn't, but once it becomes uh, inaugurated through the process of authorized worship, then the eternal eternality of the deity is established. At that point, same that with with relationships here, and there's also devotees who have been together in past lives and now they're together again in the present life. See, this is the spiritual world. In the material world, no, I'm first. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so my question is, so Bruce Barmanet, you had, um, I had a question about eternal. I think. If, it's, if you say it's eternal, then how can it be eternal if it existed, didn't exist before? Because eternal means it never, there's a time where it never began. So how can it be eternal? Well, that's, I use the, deity, the reference of the deity. Once the deity is established as the worship, then that deity becomes Krishna. It's eternally Krishna. Before then, it wasn't. So eternality begins when it, in, in the relationship with the deity. And so we can also establish a relationship now which will also become eternal. So my question was, so with Baba, you talked yesterday about low self-esteem and humility. Mm -hmm. um, so I was just reflecting and does, is there a correlation between having lower self-esteem, humility, and these qualities and varna? Because do certain varnas have sort of more lower self-esteem? Are they more likely to have um, sort of dependency on wanting validation? And are certain varnas more uh, humble? And then on another related question to that is, are you more likely to become humble and develop these qualities if you're situated in the right varna? Because then you're correctly aligned with your service and your connection. So then naturally, if, if that's aligned, then do you, do you become more humble? So just a... Okay, so let me answer the first part. There's a story about a Brahmin who was very pucker. He would do everything at the right time and so on. So um, he went for a nap before his um, Gayatri. And then what was happening is it was actually almost past the time for him to do the Gayatri. And so someone woke him up and they said to him, look, quickly, you know, it's almost past the time you should do your Gayatri. So he did the Gayatri and he thanked the person and he said to the person, who are you? The person said, I'm Maya personified. And the Brahman was a bit confused. He said, but you, you woke me up on time to do my Gayatri. And he said, yeah, he said, because I saw that you were such a proud person. Had you missed your Gayatri on the time, what would have happened is you would have actually developed some real humility and made some real spiritual progress. <laughs> so I deliberately made sure that you woke up on time to get you to do your Gayatri on time so you would continue to feel that you're better than other people. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. 
So the point is that, it's, and then, you know, this famous story, the Prabhupada tells of the Brahmin and the, and the cobbler, right? It's a famous, you know that story, some of you know that story. Anyway, I gave him one example, so I won't, I won't do it. But the, the, sorry? Was, yeah, so the point, the, the point is, it's a question of consciousness, ultimately. You know, the point is that anyone, and Krishna makes that point in the Bhagavad Gita, anyone can become a devotee of the Lord, anyone can become pure. It's a question of consciousness. And then if you want to take it on a deeper level, we mentioned over the last few days, Lord Chaitanya has come to deliver the most fallen. So actually, our qualification is that we feel ourselves to be the most fallen. You know? So we should not have any, we should not use any material de designation to think I'm above other people, or I'm better than other people. Rather, the, the sign of advancement is, as the, the example that we discussed earlier, the one feels themselves to be the servant, purely the servant of the servant. And that cultivation will keep us safe. So in Kali Yuga, what you'll find is, see every, like, now going to, linking it to the second part, every Varna has something that helps, that can help them to make spiritual advancement. Right? So for the Brahmanas, it may be that they like to cultivate and study and be philosophical. That can help them if it's directed towards Shastra. You'll find that the Kshatriyas, they can be very dutiful, right? So that can help them very self-discipline. For the Vaishyas, they can be very industrious. They like to work hard, right? That can help them. For the Shudras, they have a very strong service attitude. So in every situation, it's a question of what, how we're using what we have in Krishna's service. And if we do that, we can become purified. So that said, if someone is well situated, which is the other thing that you asked me, be, see, Prabhupada writes in one place, if one is well situated, it helps them to be in the mode of goodness. And then in the, in the eighth canto of Bhagavatam, chapter 2, text number 30, Prabhupada talks about fighting Maya from a position of strength. That's in the purple. You see? It's Kajena Moksha, yeah. yeah. So then that point is also made by Prabhupada, meaning that he says actually one should not be in a position where one's mental, physical strength is, is weakened. You see? So from that point of view, if one is well situated, definitely it's favourable. Yeah, but then, it's, but then it's a position. Now, what do I do with that position? I have to use that favorable position to, to make advancement in Krishna consciousness. Right? Otherwise, was it Shwami here, um, Adi Kedara? If one doesn't actually use that to make advancement and to offer that to Krishna and to grow in Krishna consciousness, it's just another material thing. Yeah? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, thank you for your question. Thank you. <laughs> Don't, yeah, just, yeah. Great. Okay. She's been very patient. <laughs> I'm following the story, the first should I just uh, following uh not Hey, it's not Yeah, okay. Uh following the story you have Okay, here you go. Okay, test okay. test. Uh so um I would like to come back to the topic of choices. If we exclude the method which you were talking about, how do we uh, understand when we have a choice in life, what would be the correct one? What is uh, the opportunity uh, given to us by Krishna? Are you talking about material or spiritual? Uh, I would say, uh, yes, I, I mean, for example, just a concrete example, which country to be in. If you don't understand which choice will give you spiritual benefit, uh, and how then to understand uh, what is uh, Krishna plan. Mm. Right. How do we make a decision on which way we should go, but our goal is to make advancement, right? That's pretty much the end result, I have a choice, which one will actually be beneficial for me? So how do we determine what to choose? Um, well, first of all, you, you have to see, well, what, am I, what do I really want? And then you can also learn that, I mean, everything we experience is not like it's the first time. This, there's nothing new under the sun. People have gone through the same things that we've been going through and discussing since time immemorial. 
So you also refer to history to see how things may play out based on the different options that you have and see how people in this similar situations chose and what was the result of their choice. That's one thing you can consider, using history as a way to understand how to act in the present. So that's, what, that's the benefit of the past. The past teaches us what to avoid and what to focus on and what to go for. Um, and we have, of course, the history of our, our Sampradaya, our Acharyas. Their examples are also there. That's why there's so many examples in the Bhagavatam from great souls who have similar situations. And that, that, that's there, not simply to illustrate what they went through, but to also teach us how we may be faced with the same thing and how what would be the right way to decide. A second thing, and this is also maybe equally as important, is to get advice from people who you know can help you. Um, I always say that each and every devotee should have someone they could go to when they need some problem, when they have, when they're faced with difficulties or reverses in life, or just making very big choices. Um, I'll give you an example, my personal example. I was running a preaching center in one city in America called Cincinnati, Ohio. And I was pretty much doing most of the activities of the preaching center. I was preaching, I was cleaning, I was fixing the building and collecting, doing everything. And then people would come and assist me in different ways, but mostly I was alone. Um, at one point, I took sannyas, that was in 1980. Six, and then I was continuing with the preaching center, and so then I was getting advice from some of my friends and other devotees. And now you're a sannyasi. Sannyasi means to travel and preach. That's one of the main principles of sannyas life. So you should move in that direction. But then again, there was the preaching center. And so I thought, all right, if I could turn the preaching of center over to someone, then I could go out. But I couldn't find anyone to take over the responsibility. And then the question is, so maybe I should stay in the preaching center and as a sannyasi. But it kept going, should I go or should I not go? So I thought, well, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, when he wanted to uh, leave for his tour on South, South India, he first consulted with his devotees and they gave him, they told him, no, it's not a time to go. You should go at a later time. If the Rathiyatra is coming up now, go after the Rathiyatra. And so he took their advice. Of course, eventually he made his own decision after a couple of years and he actually went. But the point was, even the Lord was taking advice from others to, make, to show by example that if you have a, an important thing in your life, you should go for it, get advice from others who may be able to help you, who know, who, who have a good track record of helping others. So I did that. I went back and I went to some of the devotees who were really close to me, some were senior. Some were saying, stay. You don't, the, what will happen to all those devotees in the preaching center if you close it? And what others were saying, no, just go because this is your dharma. Yeah. So I couldn't, I was getting both recommendations. So then I remember, you, you gotta listen for that voice that, of the Supreme coming through someone. And I wasn't hearing it from either side. Then I went to his Guru Maharaj, <laughs> Bhakti Tirtha Swami. And I came, and this was after a little while of struggling with this, this, this dilemma. And uh, I, uh, 
we were sitting together, it was in the evening time, and um, I told him my situation. And he sat there and he thought for a minute. He didn't respond immediately. And then he got up in a very dramatic way, waved his hand in the air and said, go out. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I heard Krishna. That's when I heard Krishna. I was looking for that voice coming from the Supreme Lord. It came through his Guru Maharaj Bhakti Tirtha Swam. Then there was no doubt. And I didn't, any other consideration after that that no, didn't, didn't matter. I, we closed the preaching center and then I just went out and did, and then I just traveled. So that's an example of taking advice from someone who's qualified to give advice. And other people were also qualified, but I didn't hear that voice, that voice, which I felt was the voice of the Supreme Lord speaking through others. They spoke through his, well, they spoke in such a way that it was, was no doubt for me. It went to my heart. It didn't just go to my mind. It was like, okay, yeah, I got it. <laughs> so that's an example of how we should take help, assistance from other devotees when we find ourselves in situations like that. And that will minimize the possibility of moving in the wrong direction. Maybe even eliminate it completely. And I always say every devotee in our movement should have one very senior person they can go to and say, this is my situation. Please give me some advice. Everyone should have that. Even those who are giving advice, they, they should also have that person. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, I hope that helps. Yes, I, I trust that person. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, go to Bhavana wants to add. I just wanted to um, echo what Mike said. It's the first canto of Bhagavad <laughs> 2, chapter 19, text number 12. In the purple, Prabhupada says every major decision should be confirmed by some authority. He said that makes the matter perfect. So it's exactly as Marge said, it's, it's there in Prabhupada's books. So that's the first thing. The second is that when we have a desire to actually do something which is favorable for our Krishna consciousness, that's, I think that's, again, Marge made the point earlier about desire. So first of all, the fact that we want to find a solution, an answer that's actually going to help us, that's really important because Krishna itself, he's giving knowledge, he's giving remembrance, and he's giving forgetfulness. So the first thing is that we want that intention. What came to mind when I heard your question is that we know that in the, the symptoms of surrender, the first is to accept what's favorable, the second is to reject what's unfavorable. So along with the desire, I found that and, you know, having that person that we can, or those devotees that we can get guidance from, I also see that sometimes part of the clarification is that we've also done some research. So let's say I've got two options. So have I looked into what's available? If I go to this particular, in, if I go in this particular direction, what am I likely to experience? And if I go in this particular direction, what am I likely to experience? So all of those things can come together because we have the right desire, we've made the right endeavor, and also we've, we have the humility to inquire. And just to Marjorie's point, we were speaking this morning, so we were together in, in London and we were having lunch, and it was a, a, a program for Bhakti Charan Maharaj. And then um, John Mui Maharaj came, um, turned to me and he said, um, Bhavan, I was thinking about you, and you mentioned the particular service, and I think you should do this service. And when I heard him speak, it also went straight to the heart because I, I'd heard that point before and I could understand it's definitely Krishna through Maharaj telling me you should be doing this. Now I've mentioned we've had that discussion this morning and, and so it, it really does work and that's why I'm so enthusiastic about the devotees, you know, inquiring because spiritual life does not have to be as difficult as most devotees think it is. It's just more on the application, you know, it is there, six loving exchanges revealing the mind, inquiring confidentially. It's just that we don't always apply what's actually given in the books. And because we don't apply what's given in the books, we end up having difficulties. And then we will often think it's Krishna consciousness that's difficult, rather than it's the fact that we're not quite applying it in the way that we could be applying it, which is where the difficulty is coming in. 
It's like a doctor giving some medicine and we say, well, I'm not getting cured. It's like, right, but are you taking the medicine at the frequency that I told you? I told you to take it after a meal, you know, and, and I told you to take two pills. Are you doing that? Well, I'm taking it every now and then. It's like, well, that's, that's why the difficulty is coming. Because the prescription is here saying this is how it should be taken, but we're doing it in a different way. Yeah, and that's, that's where sometimes the difficulty comes. Thank you. Um, I understand this doctor is a spiritual guru. So when we don't have a guru yet, we, we have Srila Prabhupada, but unfortunately we not always find the, the response or unable to find the response in the books or lectures. Uh, so therefore we have to ask people who are not our guru and we do not always accept it, you know, as a prescribed medicine. So we sort of, okay, thank you for your opinion uh, situation. So it means that you still, you still have to, I mean, you're still alone before you get a guru, before you find one. No? Well, we have the, we have the society of devotees. And, but the, like, if someone comes to me and they're not my disciple and they want advice, I don't say, well, you're not my disciple. No, fine. This is our, we're, Prabhupada set it up like a family. And that, you know, the gurus are all brothers. And, and, we, and all of the, those who are coming are like, those who are like children. <laughs> and so it doesn't matter who comes or why they come. If someone comes for advice, we can, we'll give advice. I won't reject anyone unless I know that they're not serious. If I know they're not serious. Like some people just like to ask things just for the sake of seeing what, what answers they, they can get. Like sometimes when, I, when people come to me and I say, well, who else did you speak to prior to coming here? And what did they say? Because sometimes people are not sincere and they're looking for an answer that which they would that seems to be the easiest thing to carry out <laughs> rather than the thing that is the most needed. It tests a person's sincerity. But as far as your from your perspective, there are senior devotees who are always in the position to give their time to help others. That's the way the society is organized. And don't be afraid to ask. You shouldn't think, well, they're so busy. No. Even if they can't do it, they can make, they'll help you get the answer you need by giving you advice to go to somewhere else. Or, you know. Thank you very much. this question when um, it, we ask for advice or even if even if um, for other people are just out of their, their kindness offering advice sometimes I feel like it's it's too much and I feel overwhelmed and I feel kind of um, in a sense attacked I don't know what to do I get confused I don't know like what to listen to. I can't find Krishna's voice. Tell me like I don't know what what to do because I just feel like I just people constant constantly telling me this and that, and I don't. And it, it's just it's too much. And everyone's getting involved. Yeah. That's unsolicited advice, right? People just want to come and give you advice without you asking for it, right? That's something else. <laughs> in the sense that that may not be beneficial. There are people who think they can give advice to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and they like to do that. They feel like this is their good, the way to, to serve other people. Either they're not, but they're not qualified. And they don't know the situation sometimes. You only go, you always take advice from those you, who you choose to get advice from. Oh, just, if someone else gives advice, think about it, but, but that's all. And if you think it's valuable, then you can accept it. If you don't, then... Thank you. 
But when someone tries to force something, then you see there is a motivation there. I think it's out of kindness. I think it's just me getting overwhelmed. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How to get up. If you, you know, sometimes the answers don't come right away. And sometimes you have to think about things and reference them with other people who had similar experiences. Like when householders have problems, a lot of times they come to the sannyasis, and the sannyasis try to help. But I found it from my own experience is to direct them with two other householders who are really fixed in their own grihastha ashram. They have experience. And they can they can give more what we say realized understanding. The sannyasis can do it also up to a certain degree, but a personal experience they don't have. At least, you know, in that ashram. So yeah, go for people who who were in similar situations, who who have some experience. It's amazing, sometimes we struggle with a problem and all of a sudden someone says one thing and the answer is the whole thing. But the answers are always there, you just have to find them. You still have to make an effort. If you don't make an effort, it won't come also. Because your effort is your desire and your desire is the quality of what, what will come to you or not come to you. I can tell you one thing I would say. I find my own personal choices, like I have, my history is I've always been in a quandary of decisions. It's just my, it's my astrological feature. <laughs> I have a hard time making decisions. But now I've come to one realization. I chant good rounds, I try to. And ever since my rounds have increase in quality, decisions become so easy and so more normal and more natural. And that, that, says, that says, goes back to what we're talking about today, about the glories of the holy name. It solidifies your consciousness and pushes you in the right direction also. Even in making decisions in, on day-to-day -day life, the holy name really is the means for moving forward in all areas of life, spiritual life. So, yeah. So, my problem with indecision is no longer there anymore, at least. Now it's easy, because I chant 16 rounds before I do anything. <laughs> before, that's before I take breakfast, anyway. I won't, I won't take breakfast until 16 rounds are done. And we, if we make these kind of vows, then we can actual, actualize the, that austerity allows us to develop that consciousness. Because the chanting early is really very powerful. And I've talked to many devotees who adopted that, and they say it's a qualitative difference in my whole Krishna consciousness. Early japa as opposed to japa that is sprinkled throughout the day. Big difference. Big difference. If you can apply that, you'll see the difference in your Krishna consciousness. A lot difference. Yeah. And it's also spoken by the Acharyas too. That this is how we should practice. Anyway, that's my realization. <laughs> Thank you for the questions. We will have uh, another Q&A session tomorrow, so save your questions for then. Uh, so now we can...